first speakers today, which are Giulia Frova and Magda Gere Gebremariam Tesfau. Giulia is program coordinator at Il Razzismo Una Brutta Storia, raising a bad, his, bad story, and board member of the European Network Against Racism. Giulia holds a BA in International Relations and Development Studies from the University of Sussex and a Master's in Social and Community Theatre from the University of Turin. As an anti-racist and trans-feminist activist from Jewish background, Giulia loves dance, puppetry, social justice, and beach road. Magda is a PhD student in social sciences at the University of Padua, adjunct professor at IUA uh, Mantua University, and stands for in Florence. She collaborates with the Association Razzismo Brutta Storia. Her field of work and investigation ranges from racism to anti-racist practices, with a particular focus on structural racism and racial capitalism in a historical perspective. Magda is also board member of the Refugees Welcome Italia. Over to you, Giulia and Magda, the floor is yours. Thank you. We didn't know that the, the, the bios were going to be read and shared. Now, now you may you make us double think um, on them. Um, so I, I will give a, um, a short presentation on, on RBS uh, anti-racist work and, and alliances work and then pass it over to Magda for, for talking about a project that we have that um, specifically is trying to create these kind of spaces. Um, Magda, do you want to add something or shall I just go? <laughs> go. Um, okay, so um, I will share some, some slides. Um, to give you an idea on, on what um, Razzismo Brutta Storia is. Um, it is an, an organization that was uh, created, um, actually I have two sets of slides, one in English, one in Italian. It was created um, in 2008 uh, when there was a racial killing in Milan um, of uh, 19 years old um, Abdul William Gibre that everybody knows as Abba. Uh, he, he was uh, a young um, Italian citizen from Milan who was beaten to death by the owners of a, of a tobacco shop um, and using N-word and everything. And his, his death still didn't get the recognition of the racial um, motive um, still today. Um, when, when this happened, it was 2008, and the whole city reacted, and um, Feltrinelli, which is a publisher group that I don't know if anybody knows, actually, I don't know who is, is, um, who is there <laughs> listening to us, um, but Feltrinelli, uh, as, a, as a publishing house, a publisher's group that has a a strong history of, of social engagement in Italy, decided to um, put up this campaign, Razzismo Brutta Storia, um, to say that um, not, no forms of racism and discrimination should be accepted in Italy, and also imagining that the trajectory for, for Italy uh, would um, would grow more and more racist over the over the years. Um, so the the launch of the campaign was um, followed by events uh, events with uh, with Abbas family and, and and different cultural events. And actually now, I I, I am not um, at at the dentist <laughs> with all these pictures in the background, but I am in in the publishing house Feltrinelli that 
from, from then on started to print out this logo, Razzismo Brutta Storia, in every book that they publish, even if it is a book on, on gardening or anything, um, as a message. Then from, from two, uh, this, this is a presentation um, that, that uh, we made uh, for, for uh, when we presented a work that also involves one of the other speakers, Benedicta. That's why it says, I am Rosa Parks. Um, anyway, from, from then on, the um, campaign turned into an association, um, working a lot with schools. This is a project uh, with the office UNAR, um, the, 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 the official um, office, national office against discrimination um, that involved distributing uh, anti-racist short films uh, to hundreds of, of teachers in different Italian cities. And Razzismo um, Bruttastaria over the years worked a lot on, on citizenship reform and um, launched the, the campaign, well, co-launched the campaign L'Italia Sono Anch'io for changing the, the citizenship law, which um, in Italy uh, it, it involves um, a completely discriminatory institutional racism. Um, you, I, I don't know how many of you are, are, are aware of this aspect, but um, yeah, you, are, you, you don't get citizenship even though you're born in Italy. Um, and you have to apply for a very short window of time. And now the, the situation has been aggravated over the last years with new requirements. Um, but these campaigns as together with other campaigns didn't bring out the reform. Um, and this is something um, that we analyzed also very much um, of why it didn't happen and what we should do differently. Uh, these are other moments of the, of the fight for the, for the campaign together with the Italians without citizenship movement represented by Benedicta here. Um, and over, over the years, because it's quite a lot of years, the association published different materials together with Feltinelli. This is a Welcome to Italy. It's a practical guide for migrants and refugees in five languages. And this is a short film. I am Rosa Parks, um, Benedicta, again, if you, if you want to talk about more about this, this was to, 2019. Uh, then in 2019, the association started questioning also its way to do anti-racism, its, let's say, uh, most almost complete whiteness uh, in, in, the, in the Feltrinelli structure. Um, and what it what it meant to do um, effective anti-racism work. Um, so we created a, a group of associated experts. You can see some some pictures of some of them here, um, and started uh, discussing what the priorities were. Uh, and how the work of the association could better reflect the, the necessities that were expect, direct, expressed um, directly from racialized people. Um, we did different projects. We, we did delegations and trainings and different um, advocacy um, work and initiatives and we are still in the um, in a in a let's say evolution phase um, in terms of um, blackness and black identities and whiteness um, 
it has been clear to us that after the George Floyd's assassination and the whole Black Lives Matter movement um, globally and, and with, the, with the echo that it had in Italy, um, this, this, has, uh, this has had created a, an, an, a new space that also translated into uh, working more with, Afro, with people from African descent in, as, as the, the groups that were more connected with the work of, of Razzismo Brutta Storia. Um, and what we had started before uh, George Floyd's uh, killing was already a work on how culture could help us understand um, whiteness and, and the, the color line in the Italian context um, and the, the specifics uh, of, of, of racialization in Italy of, of the, for instance, the internal colonialism from, from the north to the south, uh, the history of, of uh, women from the south uh, getting their skin whitened, um, and the, the line of color for, for the Italians that were migrating abroad. And we are still working on, on these uh, as a with the research lines that we have uh, active um, and at the same time um, investing in the, the, the work against um, anti-black racism and Afrophobia. Um, and I don't know how many minutes I have left, but, um, I, oh, five, but, um, well, I, I was gonna pass it over to Magda to go into into the project. Um, I maybe I just add uh, some well, one minute on um, on what you were saying on what kind of spaces we we can create in Italy. Um, what Razzismo Brutta Storia has done with this constitution of associated experts group that is under a, an evolutionary phase was exactly this like creation of a, of a safer space where it was possible to discuss what we were doing and why and uh, because George Floyd brought about all this all this attention to, to, to racism, but not really in a, in a way that was um, necessarily producing more awareness. There was also a lot of uh, unaware <laughs> uh, ways of, uh, of putting light to things as Italy had just discovered racism after George Floyd. Uh, so this was a, a space for us to understand what, what was happening, what we were talking about, what were the issues, and also um, what could be uh, learned to, to fight racism from an intersectional perspective. Uh, and um, that's, what we, that's what we tried to do, to link up issues and uh think about class and gender and different forms of racialization uh, and uh, finally uh, at the moment we are seeing in italy a strong rise in fascist uh, attitudes and ideas and um, this is something that pressures us to, to, to really think about what, what we are doing because, um, for example, in Milan, we have neo racismo uh, is based in Milan, but of course works on a national level through the, the bookshops and through the, the, our network. Uh, but yeah, only in Milan, we have neo-fascist neo groups uh, that are gathering every Saturday in, in squares where they could 
not have <laughs> shown up for 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 decades. Um, so something is happening also with the COVID, with poverty rising, with the whole ways in which the pro, the, um, the the discontent can be used politically. Um, and uh, so it's personally, I, I, I add that uh, I'm interested in seeing also with the new forms of anti-Semitism that are coming up, like what can be uh, done and, 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 and learned in, in spaces where we can openly build alliances. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Julia. And maybe I have one minute. I, I can. I will take two minutes just to. Yeah, three uh, minutes is fine. Yeah, thank you. I will take three minutes just to speak about a specific project, uh, which is called Champs, which is an acronym uh, acronym for a Champion of Human Rights and Multipliers Countering Afrophobia and Afrophobic Speech, which is a project uh, that belongs to the uh, REC uh, funding, European funding, uh, so rights, equality and citizenship that we are uh, conducting. Uh, we are in this project as members with uh, uh, AMREF Italia as uh, um, main partner and other uh, Italian association involved in anti-racism. Uh, and specifically some black organization such as Festival Diversity, uh, Le Rezo, and uh, uh, Rising Africans as collaborators. And uh, it is a, um, a project that aims at empower and empowering uh, black, uh, black people and black association, uh, as well as uh, doing an advocacy work uh, with uh, on uh, Afrophobia against Afrophobia, <laughs> of course. Um, this project is um, it, it, it is developed at, at a national level, and uh, the main uh, the main uh, uh, activities are uh, the deconstruction of a coalition uh, of twenty five uh, Afro descendants that are called Afar. Uh, of course, Benedicta <laughs> is one of them, because <laughs> Benedicta is the, the protagonist of our uh, presentation, um, clearly. And uh, um, also, and a training for these 25 person who will be uh, bringing uh, uh, activities of, uh, um, who will then lead uh, um, sensibility um, of activities of dissemination uh, um, in all uh, the national uh, territory and uh, a capacity building on black association. So we will train this association in order for, in order for them to be um, more um, capable of attracting uh, fundings and uh, organize uh, uh, project. And um, then we have uh, some outputs, uh, such as a toolkit, a dossier, and a manifesto. Who, and these outputs will, uh, um, will be um, some instrument we will use uh, uh, in order to bring up this uh, anti-racist work in Italy. I'm just showing you uh, the the project um, paper and um, I'm sorry we don't have enough time to talk about uh, the, the specific of this project but this is our first project that is uh, that directly target just the black people uh, in Italy um, so in Italy the context is like uh, difficult because we cannot really um, you know, uh, separate uh, uh, migration from blackness, uh, uh, even if we are like, maybe we have third generation uh, black people in Italy, but still uh, uh, migration is, uh, uh, is a recent uh, uh, experience for uh, most of people of African descent in Italy. Um, so 
uh, we target both of these, uh, like people, first generation um, Italian, black Italians and second generation and third generation black Italians. And uh, if you have any question on the project, uh, we will soon have uh, um, more, uh, more um, materials and I will be very happy of showing it to you and sending it to you and answer to all of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie and Magda. Um, yes, so as Magda just said, if you have any questions about uh, our speaker's presentation, you can send them using the uh, Q&A feature. Um, we know that Magda has to leave shortly. So again, if you have questions about the CHAMPS project specifically that Magda just talked about, um, just send them to us or to her directly. Um, and uh, we can pass them on to her. Um, thank you again. Our next speaker is Benedicta Jumpa. Benedicta is the host and creator of the podcast, The Chronicles of a Black Italian Woman. She's an activist for citizenship rights for Italians born or raised in Italy to foreign parents and focuses on anti-racism. She was born and raised in the province of Brescia, Northern Italy, and from a very young age, she has been passionate about politics and social justice. She's a graduate in international relations from London Metropolitan University and holds an LLM in international relations from U, not sure I can pronounce this, Union, University of Ro in Rome. Sorry about that, Benedicta. In 2018, um, Benedicta portrayed Rosa Parks in the short award-winning movie, Io sono Rosa Parks. Also in, in 2018, Benedicta was selected to participate in the policy school founded by former Prime Minister Enrico Letta. Since January 2018, she has been working with Temple University Rome and she works on promoting diversity and inclusion among students, faculty and staff. She also coordinates Black History Month at Temple Rome with the aim of celebrating the African diaspora in Italy. Benedicta's paper is entitled Activism as Self-Care, Finding Balance and Your Voice. Over to you, Benedicta. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction, Marina. Thank you for the university for inviting me and Combola for organizing this. Thank you so much. And it's great to be here with um, for the people and activists that I know, and uh, thank you so much for the introduction. So I will say, I will start with like a brief introduction. So I will say hello, ciao, and welcome to the Chronicles of a Black Italian Women. That's normally how I introduce my podcast, but don't worry about it. It's not going to be like an episode, but it could be something similar to that. It's going to be like a, maybe a mini solo episode. And the title, as Marina said earlier, is Activism as Self-Care and Finding Balance and Your Voice. And before I forget, let me share this slide as well. So I can, so you can see like the logo of the podcast. There we go. And, and we hope also that my internet will stay on as well. So uh, there we go. Lovely, and yeah, there we are. And uh, so let me tell you a little bit more about myself, although Marina and others that spoke about me earlier and I'm so grateful for this opportunity. So I officially like became an activist in 2017 for uh, citizenship rights of first generation Italians. Although my passion for politics and history started way before that, because even before I was then, I knew what racism was um, due to my direct experience with it. And I had an understanding about inequalities and their relationship with politics as well. And probably I'm still the first black female representative from my academic in Italy. At the age of 16, 16 between 16 and 17, I found myself um, being asking for the permit to stay in the country that I was born in. So due to my personal story, 
but also because of the desire to not see other generations faces the same challenges that I face. I became officially an activist in 2017 as part of the movement, especially for Italians of foreign background with a focus on anti-racism. And I campaigned at the time when there was a discussion for the reform for the Italian citizenship law. So also activism actually brought me to my current job with a US uh, study abroad campus based in Rome in 2018. I was very excited to leave my American dream that was sold to me, especially through uh, Will Smith and the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, uh, the dream of diversity, equality, seeing success for Black people. And definitely that's a subject that was a desire to achieve me. I was so grateful for, and I'm still grateful to work within that context. But of course, I came to realize very shortly that the American dream is mainly a myth. And also that it, there is something very different about the study abroad industry. So I came to realize that actually still the study abroad industry is overall still predominantly white between students, staff, and also faculty. Um, oftentimes there have been changes throughout the years. More people, uh, especially students of color, are accessing study, the study abroad field. There have been discussion about diversity and inclusion, but still there is kind of an idea and uh, probably an unconscious idea, a liberal idea that through travels, we can, we can erase racism and any form of discrimination. Uh, within my field, I work with students to contextualize to Italy, like the issues of gender, race, sexuality, and much more. And I also organize training opportunities with faculty and staff. And I create a post an environment to create safe spaces for students and amplify the voices of underrepresented students. So why am I telling you all of this to talk about my podcast? Because my podcast came to be at so many different moments. My podcast started through many different uh, ideas. And so as an activist, I realized that I needed to better elaborate my own thoughts outside of the movement I was part of and elaborate more on my experiences. Also through the conversation of my students, with my students, I got so much inspiration as well and understanding about identities and social justice in a global context. So one of them, one of my students actually shared with me that my podcast actually reminds them of the conversation that we will have in my office about identities and social justice. I actually made a use of Blackout Tuesday. I know it was quite controversial, but actually I used the original purpose of it to reflect in 2020 on what I could do better to fight racism. And so I decided, I realized, I came to realize that actually I, I navigated blackness on many different levels because in Italy, between my Ghanaian family, I navigated blackness with my parents being part, being from two different, completely different backgrounds from the same country, Ghana. And also I navigated blackness between Italian society. And while studying in London, I navigated blackness there, what it meant to be black and Italian, and also got to learn about the black British experience. Uh, also within my work, I got to learn more about my blackness, my Italian blackness, how it relates to the blackness of my student, for example, coming from the, to, from the US. I came to realize in 2020 that I really did have something to share. And thanks to also my therapist, who happens to be black, I realized the importance of using my voice, not only to speak for others, but also to speak for me and advocate for myself in order to better advocate for others. Thanks to my best friend, Beb the Gift, uh, I was able to purchase uh, my microphone and my headphones that I'm currently using to create my own podcast. And through that, I was able to also, I worked on learning how to edit and create content for myself 
So for example, if you can see here, like this is the cover of my podcast and uh, I learned how to use like different tool design kits and through that, uh, I was able to create my podcast came to be, which is titled The Chronicles of the Black Italian Women. And why did I title it this way? Well, I definitely have lots of stories to tell and probably you can tell a lot of your stories a little bit. And also just, at this, I mean, I've got an inspiration that I've got from, especially from my dad. My dad, as this when I was growing up, used to tell us a lot of stories about Africa, about the continent, about his experience with colonialism, but also told us a lot of stories about his migrant journey and what it meant for him growing up in Ghana and having a dream to come to Europe. So with that, I realized that I want to uh, also my title of the rise with the fact that I wanted people to make peace with themselves with the fact that black any topics so with that uh, I try to make that process easier for them so the main purpose the main purpose of my podcast I will probably identify with the word connection is a connection to myself to as an act of self-care of sharing, because as Angela Davis said, self-care is also activism because it's needed for activists to truly for truly for them to show up as themselves. It's also a way to connect to others and build community. I have a segment which is called the Aspra, and which and tries to build community among people of the African diaspora around the world, but not only, also, also beyond, beyond. As well, I connect the world to Italy, which is a country with very complex issues, and I try to make it more accessible through daily content. And so another the purposes of my podcast is also to create digestible content because oftentimes we, within anti-racism, we can end up being very academic in order to make sense of the reality that we are around. But I try to make it very digestible through daily content, even after sharing my passions, for example, K-dramas. And uh, it's also like, it's a way to raise awareness on different issues too. So I like to uh, invite guests. This, for example, is one of my dearest friends from London, Nana Sewa uh, Osei, and she is a nurse in London. She's British Ghanaian, uh, and she has shared about like um, sickle cell anemia, which is the issue that deeply affects especially communities of African descent. So through my podcast, I raised awareness of these issues, but also in the past, I've raised awareness also on topics such as um, Stop Asian AIDS. And so I'm trying to build as well a connection between the African diaspora and the Asian diaspora too. So with this, um, also I can identify as well an indirect purpose of my podcast which is also to challenge an idea. Oftentimes there is this idea that as activists, we are just strong, especially as black women. We are oftentimes there is this strong, this idea, the black women are simply identified as strong. And oftentimes through this narrative, we see a dehumanization of activists and of womenhood and especially black womenhood. So between in the internal circles of activism, we oftentimes just expect it to show up and without really questioning or how we do it. And between our capitalist society and outside of our groups, we are respected to just present a product, but from, from us without questioning the system that produces that product. And so without, and oftentimes when we're asked to show up, nobody looks at the complexity of activists without fully looking about uh, our humanity. And oftentimes we are not asked if we are okay. So with that said, I wanted to thank again uh, Cardiff University. And I also wanted to share the, um, the page of my podcast and as well I, will, I can put the link in the chat to my podcast as well and I'll remain available for questions thank you so much for everybody being here
I hope I stick to the time correct. Yes, you did. Um, you've even got a couple of minutes <laughs> left. Um, but yeah, that was great. Um, Benedicta, thank you so much. And uh, any questions for Benedicta and her presentation? on her presentation, please send them using the Q&A function. Um, our third speaker is Emmanuel Marechal. Emmanuel is the co-founder and co-host of Black Coffee, the Italian podcast that talks about black identities with no filter. Emmanuel and Ariam Tegle, her co-founder, met in November 2019 for the LBD Stories project an Instagram profile and podcast in which Emmanuel told her family story and interviewed Black people from the Africa diaspora. Ariam is a documentary filmmaker who focuses on the Eritrean diaspora in Italy. After meeting, they realized they share similar views on the African diaspora in Europe and the situation of Black people. Those they decided to start a podcast, Black Coffee Together. The main aim of the podcast is to change the dominant narrative by Italian media about being Black in Italy. This year, they were the recipients of the Culture of Solidarity Fund created by the, Euro the European Cultural Foundation, which allowed them to discuss the stories of Black Italians at a European level and to explore Black Europe. Emmanuel will deliver a presentation entitled Challenging the Media Narrative about Black People in Italy by Owning Our Stories. Over to you, Emmanuel. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for um, inviting me to take part to this, um, to this talk. Uh, as you can hear, I'm French, so um, that, that can be kind of weird for you to uh, wonder why you know, I'm here talking about Italy, but it's because I've lived there for uh, five years. I studied there. And um, the first thing I noticed when I arrived in Italy is that um, I, I arrived in Italy in 2009 in Bologna to be um, uh, precise. And um, I just saw no black people in the city, which was weird for me coming from a French uh, context. And the only black people I saw were uh, street vendors that are often immigrants, you know? So I was like, so what does it mean for an Italian person uh, to understand, you know, what blackness means? Um, so at that moment, I was like, okay, that's, uh, that's interesting because that was my first experience outside of France. So I have, uh, you know, two countries to, um, to compare. Um, then uh, after my studies went to um, uh, work in Germany, this was also a different, a very different experience. I was in Munich, very white city, cradle of Nazism, <laughs> uh, you know. Um, and then I came to London where uh, I actually started to embrace my uh, blackness a lot more. Um, because, you know, uh, London is kind of a hub of uh, many um, identities and many people. Uh, but I also noticed that there was kind of, um, a gap and let's say between all the diasporas. So if you are Anglophone, you actually don't know about the Francophone Africa or um, Lusophone Africa, for example, and I found it weird. Uh, so I decided to start the LBD stories where actually I was telling also my, um, my family story because as you cannot see, I was raised um, by the, the person who, the father who raised me is, um, is a white person. I don't know my biological father. Then you have my mother who is Cameroonian and my brother who is mixed. So just from that experience, my, my life is very different from any other, um, you know, even French black person. I don't have the same experience because my father is not, like didn't raise me as my stepfather, but like my father. So that, you know, changed my identity a lot. Um, so when I arrived to London, I was like, okay, I can discover more my uh, my identity, but I was also, you know, puzzled as to why, you know, people uh, didn't know about other uh, African diasporas within the black communities, you know, there. Um, so I started the Ability Stories where um, I decided to interview uh, um, people of um, African descent in London. And obviously I noticed there were a lot of um, uh, black Italians uh, in, uh, in London, uh, which made me curious because, uh, it's not the same for French black people, for example. So I decided to take that trip 
to uh, to Milan because I have met um, through Instagram many uh, Black Italians um, that were based there, and there was uh, Ariam among uh, the, these people. So <laughs> the podcast we have together called Black Coffee, simply because we met around the coffee. Uh, and uh, also because we spoke more than two hours, you know, about uh, our blackness, being black in Italy, being black in Europe. And um, what uh, sparkled our collaboration is the fact that we realized, I realized, uh, speaking with her, that um, when, uh, when I was speaking to other uh, black Italians in Milan, people were either switching to English to uh, not feel uncomfortable around, you know, or you know, attract, uh, let's say, negative comments from people around, or uh, people were kind of uh, whispering because they were afraid, you know, and with Ariam it didn't happen, so I found, I found that very, um, very, very interesting. So we started the podcast uh, in the midst of the pandemic in, uh, in May 2020, and the main goal um, of the podcast, you know, was to challenge these few um, this narrative created by the media um, in Italy, uh, where uh, they don't make a difference uh, between um, <laughs> a black Italian, an immigrant, uh, or even an expat sometimes, you know, a black expat. Um, everybody is, uh, who is black is associated to migration. And uh, through the podcast, we wanted to, to show that, uh, you know, um, black is uh, diverse. And that's why we call the podcast uh, we, we said in the podcast that we are uh, talking about black identities, you know, because not the same to be, um, I don't know, um, let's say uh, Aryan is, um, is um, Eritrean, for example. It's not the same as being Ghanaian, for example, you know, and uh, also because um, Italy is very uh, fragmented um, uh, society, you know, uh, from region to region. It's very different to be black, I don't know, in Venice. Uh, than to be black uh, in Bologna, you know, wouldn't like to be in Venice, to be honest, as a black um, as a black person, for example. So we uh, started from this point to challenge, the, um, uh, you know, the narrative created by uh, by the um, by by the Italian um, media. And um, one of our goal, um, other. Um, goal was also to uh, start talking about it because when we started uh, it was a little bit before uh, George Floyd death and um, there were very few uh, realities talking about blackness in uh, Italy in Italian you had a lot of content talking about blackness in English which is not the same because it's not the same context it's not the same history so it was very important for us to bring this conversation in Italian and also avoid using all um, English, for example, you know, like in Italy, the, I found it very weird that to talk about diversity, use the word in English diversity, when you can simply say diversita, for example, that's weird to me. Um, and to we wanted to, the podcast to be uh, able to create a proper Italian um, language around uh, race and, um, and the racism. So that's, you know, the two goals we, um, we started with. Um, now the topics we are um, we are tackling with the podcast. Um, so first of all, we started with the Instagram because we kind of followed. Um, um, we, we we brought together the researches we we, we did, you know, um, uh, individually. So on my personal on my um, Instagram profile, the uh, LBD stories. I was, um, you know, portray, uh, making the portraits of uh, Black Europeans, right? That made history. So, uh, in uh, and when I was doing this uh, this research, I found there were also Black Italians. You know, um, did you know that, for example, the first Black uh, pilot was Italian in in Europe? You know, was Italian, for example. Do you know that there was a um, a black general in uh, the, during the Risorgimento period, so the unification of Italy. Nobody knows, uh, you know, this kind of stuff. And uh, using uh, these, um, let's say, uh, uh, historical figures, we also uh, started talking about uh, the way the media were talking about um, colonialism and even in the in the education field, the way colonialism is not tackled at all, uh, or it's just one line in the book and that's it. Uh, or that, for example, um, Italy has this um, very weird vision of, uh, I mean, not weird, 
most of the countries does this, uh, showing uh, colonialism as a positive uh, effect, like we brought school, we brought roads and stuff, but for who? <laughs> Certainly not for the locals, you know? Um, so we started, you know, um, putting uh, content like this, and then we uh, developed uh, more, uh, let's say, um, uh, sophisticated content with the help of uh, other um, hosts. One was the journalist Adil Mauro, who worked on um, introducing other uh, very um, important historical figures. There was this um, uh, Giorgio Marincola, for example, the um, one of the he was a resistant in during the Second World War in Italy. And uh, we uh, um, also presented uh, figures like um, 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 sorry, uh, I have back, I'm talking too much. But um, in brief, many uh, Italian, uh, many Italian figures that people don't necessarily heard of or know about because uh, Giorgio Marincola is one of the most known at the moment, but you have uh, lesser known uh, figures. And we also choose not to present figures that were necessarily positive, you know, because uh, um, there were some figures we decided to present that were quite um, controversial to show that blackness is uh, multifaceted and that it's not only, um, let's say, uh, all roses that, uh, you know, because when you live in countries that are steeped in racism, you also absorb, as a black person, you also absorb, uh, absorb this, um, you know, this racism, and it makes you do things politically, um, you know, questionable choices. So I think it was, uh, we, we thought it was a great idea to uh, present um, uh, um, uh, such uh, historical figures. Um, we also uh, take, um, we also tackle a question of mental health that we think are very important. Um, that's why we uh, invited uh, Ronke um, Uluwadare, one of, uh, you know, a very uh, well-known in the community um, figure to talk about uh, what it means to be Black in Italy and the effect it has on, on you. Uh, we also invited, uh, on, that, on the same topic, we invited um, um, uh, an activist and student called Ariman Scriba, who uh, is talking about, um, you know, um, um, she is um, encouraging, uh, you know, racialized people to go and see a psychologist because she lost her brother uh, to suicide. Um, um, due obviously to um, uh, mental health issues, but also these mental health issues were aggravated by, because of racism. So, um, you know, uh, doing all this work around it. Um, there are so many themes, but because we um, want to, um, you know, uh, show the entirety of the um, of what it means to be black in uh, in Italy. So obviously, there is the question of citizenship. For example, um, we uh, we invited um, uh, Kwanza Musido Santos, who is an activist really known in that uh, in that field. You know, um, who's doing the work with our uh, association Questa e Roma. Um, to uh, you know, bring the citizenship law into life <laughs> in Italy, and we also interviewed someone who is absolutely uh, devoid of citizenship rights, though born in Italy, is called Luca Neves, and uh, this um, this person does not have the citizenship and not even have any uh, legal papers, simply because at the time he could have. Um, he could have asked for the citizenship, he couldn't because of personal reasons, so he lost his rights. So he's like, a, um, um, I don't know who is that, a polide. Um, you know, he doesn't have any citizenship, so he cannot go out from the country, nothing. He cannot do anything, even work uh, legally. Um, so now, um, Obviously, with the podcast, we want to challenge this uh, this vision of the media. So uh, we, uh, with the the grant uh, Marina mentioned that we won, you know, in in, in my bio, we are bringing so those uh, Black Italian stories, you know, um, in English, not in Italian, uh, not only in Italian, no, but also in English, um, to the people. And we started um, uh, working with um, Quazamu. 
Juan Samusito Santos, who is actually um, working on uh, three episodes where she will bring uh, to life um, the stories of uh, different European realities, black, black European realities. So the, the first episode is already out uh, with Dr. Natasha Kelly, who is a German, um, uh, um, thank you, Marina, uh, who is a German uh, teacher um, uh, and who is uh, teaching Black studies right now in uh, Black German studies in the US. Uh, and she will bring other uh, Black European realities. So we, over one year, we, we hope to bring a different uh, host that will speak about uh, either Black Europe, um, you know, always intertwining with the Black, his Black Italian history uh, and um, other Black Italians, we talk about, you know, um, uh, different topics um, about being Black uh, in, uh, in Italy, but on a European level. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Any questions or comments sparked by Manuel's presentation, please send them in the Q&A uh, function and we'll get back to them in the second part of the seminar with a discussion. Our next speaker is Dr. Natasha Fernando. Welcome back, Natasha. Um, Natasha was here on Monday and presented a very interesting paper. Um, she's visiting lecturer at the University of Westminster. Her doctoral thesis analyzed how resident migrant communities in Milan perceived the European migration crisis in order to determine whether there was communal solidarity or purposeful disengagement from growing discrimination. As a podcaster, Natasha co has co-created and co-hosted the podcast Sconfini, and she's now a co-speaker of the podcast Sulla Razza. The series translates English terms into Italian that have mainly been used in Anglo-American race ethnic studies, such as race, colorism, the N-word, one drop rule, tokenism, and many more. Her paper today is entitled Making Space, Gaining Voice. Over to you, Natasha. Thank you, thanks so much. Um, and while I set this up, I just wanted to also, you know, um, really thanks uh, Combola Marina for this amazing, you know, event, two events actually. Uh, that are so central to what I'm doing as well on an academic and podcast level, really. Um, so, yeah, so as I was saying, really, um, in, uh, in the first webinar, you know, I was talking about empathy and anti-racism and, you know, conducting really the PhD research that I did um, which highlighted really the importance of empathy and especially of that of voice. It kind of made me uh, really aware of the need for there to be a type of media platform format in Italy that would shift, change the narrative around migration in general and that would talk about migration through the voice of the people involved in it, uh, through the voice of the actors themselves. That's how my first podcast really came about. Uh, I was talking about the themes that I was uncovering in my research with a friend of mine. Um, sorry, I'm just thinking, can you see the whole slides or is it just, yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, but yeah, I was talking about the themes, you know, and, and my research in general with a friend of mine, uh, Maria Catena Mancuso, who at the time was a an MA student at uh, the University of Westminster. Uh, she was more familiar to the world of podcasting, uh, having worked for the uh, Radio Statale in Milan. And she was uh, actually the one who first initially kind of proposed the idea to me in uh, 2018. We kind of started talking about, you know, general ideas of uh, migration. Um, in Italy of people coming to Italy and people moving away from Italy as well. And we created our first podcast uh, called Sconfini. 
And, um, you know, it was, again, about migration uh, in, uh, we say in Italian, 360 gradi, really, uh, exploring, you know, um, my, the migrants' status of people, of othering as well in Italy. Um, also highlighting the fact that Italy is a hotspot for migrations and for different types of migration. And it's something that I think, especially white Italians tend to forget, right? Or they move to other countries and they don't use the word, for example, as migrants. And I have, you know, loads of friends, uh, I'm living here in, now in, in London, who just avoid using the term immigrant or migrant to identify themselves, they use expat, something that's common not only to white Italians, but to Europeans in general. Um, and, and, you know, like we, we also had um, the, the purpose really, uh, the aim also to uncover those types of migrations that were mostly common in the past that saw Italians sort of moving away from Italy itself to famously, you know, countries such as, uh, well, here the UK, the States, Australia, uh, Argentina, but also Belgium, Luxembourg, and other European countries. And there is a sort of amnesia, not only of colonialism, but also of emigration in Italy. Uh, from the likes of, you know, uh, many white Italians. So we really just started to think of what was missing in Italy and what was missing really was a narrative on migration that came from those who experienced it themselves. Um, and also by that, I mean the, the type of migration that Maria, Maria Catena, Maria herself experienced, because, you know, she comes from a family who migrated from... Calabria to Brianza, then to London. So really kind of shining a light on different types of migratory experiences and stories, um, you know, and trying to give uh, another light, another shade, shine, shine a light to the different shades of uh, migration. And also though trying to uh, depict migration as not only made of uh, themes such as desperation and strife, which are central as well to most migratory journeys. But, you know, they're, they're not only that, they're also made of successes, of succeeding, of um, just striving, you know, striving to make a better um, sense of your life, uh, to find another um, life as well that's not only relegated to negative connotations uh, in itself. Uh, we also try to un uh, unpick uh, the so-called migration crisis discourse that I was talking about on Monday. So we interviewed different academics, uh, activists and writers who explore what it feels like to be people on the move. On a technical le level, you know, we wrote everything, we edited and produced the episodes ourselves. It really helped to have different uh, interviewees, uh, such as journalists who had written around uh, topics such as racialization in Italy as a whole. Journalists, academics, uh, activists, famous personalities, authors, um, as well. Um, and we collaborated doing this with The Submarines, which is an independent uh, media outlet, quite famous now in, uh, uh, in Italy. And we're really grateful for them as well. And uh, by doing so, uh, we also had the opportunity to interview quite a popular uh, journalist and activist who is uh, Nadisha Uyangoda, and who has now this year published her book, uh, L'unica persona nera nella stanza, uh, for 66th and second, actually, edition. And with her, you know, we, we started to talk about, well, she kind of um, approached us, me and Maria, 
and she was like you know like listen I'm actually you know thinking of doing creating a new um podcast uh, and it would be called um well we still needed to define that but she was like you know I want to analyze specific terms that are mostly used in the um Anglo-American language that though you know we use in Italy but we don't really know what they mean and so together with her during the pandemic in 2020 we kind of developed this podcast called Sulla Razza which has really a focus uh, then on linguistics it's the itself on more how we use language and on the importance really of certain terms um, and how we talk also about race, ethnicity and in, uh, in Italy and questioning really again, how we translate it into Italian key terms that we use um, in, in the English uh, language. And um, because, you know, Italy has its own practices and not only Italy, I think it's important to do this also in the UK and in different countries of Europe, as uh, Emmanuel was uh, was saying as well, uh, because you know Italy, for instance, has its own practices of um, and and its own history really of colonialism, lack of representation, its own type of representation in the media of minority communities of Black people, and its own problematic use of terms and expressions. We did, I mean, going on a technical level, we did apply for different funds and try talking to various podcast uh, producers or platforms in Italy without really any success, though. I mean, we aim to produce kind of a high level um, and not only high level, but we just wanted to get some funding to then make sure that we didn't have to edit, produce, um, market the podcast ourselves because me and Maria had done it previously and we know as other podcasters might agree with me it takes loads of time so with having other other jobs as well we we were like no we're we have to get some funding also for us to pay also contributors um, that would work with us in our podcast but yeah, so we, we talked to different um, podcasting platforms and, you know, we, we yeah, the, the responses that we got were all quite negative at times. Many of them, you know, just wasting our time really without being upfront with us because at the last minute so they would say things like, ah, oh, but you know, like we thought about it, but we already have, you know, um, a podcast that talks about migration. Right. So being very tokenistic in their approach, being like, yeah, but we already talk about, you know, um, black people in, in this podcast. We already talk about minority issues in that podcast. So we don't need a, another one. Not really kind of seeing that there can be, you know, my migration or diversity or inclusion or whatever you want to call it. I mean, you know, we can talk about things in different ways. But then we kind of luckily got approached by Juventus because, because of Nadisha's own uh, popularity, really. And they, they had read various articles uh, written by Nadisha and, you know, um, saw that Sulla Razza really would have added a certain, um, a certain kind of more mediatic, mediatic background to other programs, other, um, yeah, programs that they already had launched on an educational level, for instance, having uh, the educational program called Un Calcio al Razzismo. And uh, so despite this, despite all the hardships and everything, we, we launched Sulla Razza and it all then developed quite fluidly. Uh, we had our first season launch in January 2021 uh, with, a, with a total of uh, 12 episodes. And we started by examining the term razza, which race, 
which in itself is a problematic term in Italy um, because race is, razza is not really used anymore, but the social construct of razza and race still exists very much, right? Um, because also, you know, green lighting, the title itself, Sulla Razza, meant that we would talk to other contributors or other also friends. Uh, and I would add mostly white friends who would then tell us, you know, like maybe you should distance yourself from using the term Razza because, you know, we're all equal. Uh, we have statements of, yeah, we're all equal. There is only one race. But then the thing is that these kind of statements, though, also negate uh, the problems with racism in Italy, I feel, you know, they kind of it's, it's a shortcut, as I was saying on Monday, that doesn't fully acknowledge the fact that as a social construct, people still think of um, others as completely different from them in Italy. So aside from that, which is we explored, so we explored the term razza in the first episode, then we moved on into uh, talking about color colorism, which is linked to European colonial colonialism uh, again, but also it has, um, it, it was uh, historically, it also developed in different pre-colonial Asian societies um, you know, where fairness was deemed to be uh, the, the kind of achievable, the, the goal uh, to have in terms of beauty standards. Uh, the third episode then talked about the one drop rule. Two minutes is, left, Natasha. Sorry? Two minutes left. Two minutes left. So yeah, uh, one drop rule, again, a term system of ideas used in, um, in the United States would kind of denote, especially also in Italy, in relation to Italy, who can be defined as white and who should be termed as non-white. Uh, we then, you know, explore the issues of using the N-word in Italy, which is kind of mostly used in Italy to provoke I think, and to catch the attention uh, and interest uh, on a mediatic level, especially. Um, we then kind of moved on to also exploring the myth of the model minority, asking ourselves, okay, so who is the model minority in Italy? We then followed on with uh, several different episodes exploring uh, examining um, the aspects of diversity and exclude and sorry diversity and inclusion uh, firstly in the workplace then examining it uh, through tokenism in TV series film cinema and so on again finally exploring also examining um, let's say diversity on a liter literary level though through um, uh, the analysis of the term post-coloniality and post-colonial in Italy. And there seems to be a, a kind of categorization of post-colonial writers in Italy. Whereas if you have a certain type of background and you're a writer, then you know, you're categorized as post-colonial. Yeah, so, and, and that's kind of different in other countries. And then, yeah, so we talked about also diversity and inclusion in sports and then uh, moved on the last two episodes uh, talking about intersectionality and structural racism. We're Just gonna very to wrap up, uh, Natasha. Yes, we collaborated with Vice, also had a newsletter. Again, all this I think was possible because we were funded. Um, and uh, just very briefly, you know, just point out uh, the team of Sulla Razza. Those amazing illustrations are actually made by, created by Valeria Viersinghe, uh, who also won the Premio Mutti, which we're really proud of. Uh, to create her own kind of shorts, animated shorts. Uh, Mike Calandra Chode, 
who's the founder of Crudo Volta, um, who you'll find, you know, um, reading the quotes during the episodes. And then Francesco Fusaro, who's our sound editor and music creator in general, fantastic, uh, who helped us out also with uh, Sconfini. And that's about it. Yes. So thanks so much. Thanks for uh, so much again, Marina and Combola for having me again. And yeah, you can find my uh, emails and tags uh, if you want to contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natasha. Again, any questions, comments, thoughts on the presentation, please send them in the Q&A. Uh, quite a few questions are coming through, so that's, that's great. Um, our fifth and final speaker is Mistura Allison. Mistura is the founder of Ashiko, a visually driven platform inspired by Africa and its diaspora. She's an independent researcher, curator, and art historian. She has delivered projects with the National Gallery in Rome, the Victoria and Albert Museum, Venice Biennale, and Serendipity. Ms. Tura's curatorial practice is fueled by her interest in representing the plurality of contemporary Afro-diasporic visual and oral productions. Ms. Tura's paper today is entitled Act One on Intertwining Black Spaces and Continuous Becomings. Over to you, Ms. Tura. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for making, sharing and nurturing a space for discussion. I just want to take a second to thank you, Kombola, Marina and the University of Cardiff for having me join this panel. Um, I'd like to start this presentation really by deconstructing what it means to reclaim. You know, the textbook etymology and the definition in English um, defines it as retrieving or recovering something that was previously lost, given or paid for. You know, we are in a capitalist society after all. And, um, you know, in Italian, reclaiming, reclamare, is derived by the Latin clamare, you know, to shout. And that's obviously in typical Italian fashion, shouting. And um, I find myself drawn to the Pan-African concept word of Sankofa, which non-ironically is one that in my, pra in my curatorial practice is one that I refer to a lot. Um, it is an Akin term that literally means to go back and get it, you know. <laughs> uh, one of the Adinkra symbols for Sankofa, um, visually, it depicts a mythical bird flying forward with its head turned backwards. So I just want to start with um, this context. So what does it mean to reclaim an anti-racist space? Um, um, through my platform, Ashiko, um, or oh, actually I'd rather say our platform, Ashika, um, I have this vision of creating a village essentially and creating spaces and pedagogies for us by us. I'm reminded by the writing of Watiango who affirms that such changes when it comes to reclaiming and creating spaces are reflected in the truth that knowing oneself and one's environment was the correct basis of absorbing the world and that there could never be only one center from which to view the world, but that of different people in the world has their own culture and environment as the center. So again, playing on this idea of plurality and parallels while coexisting, hopefully. And the relevant question was therefore one of how one center related to other centers. And when thinking about this question of reclaiming in my practice, I find myself thinking about how can an expansive approach to curating take place within our immediate Italian context, as well as across the diaspora in order to effect radical transformation in artistic thought and presentation. Um, I, it might be unconventional <laughs> approach to, you know, um, actually curate catalyst social, cultural and structural change. Um, while asking this question with my peers and uh, colleagues <laughs> at the time, this concern was some, somewhat lofty and uh, there were no easy answers actually till today. <laughs> 
um, as a group, as a collective, we realized quite very quickly that there was a fault in line in terms of knowledge and practice and whether artistic or curatorial, and there was an urgent need to address gaps in art education specifically. Um, I don't know if you can already notice and of where the focus is going to be with my presentation. And I, I call this paper Act One because I like to think about um, when the context of um, discourse, discourse or rather as different acts. And uh, I like to take us back again, uh, um, sort of, um, I guess, um, inhabiting the spirit of Sankofa back to 2020. I'm so sorry, I'm taking you back to the dark times. <laughs> and we're still in the middle of a global pandemic. And uh, there is a tenacious and a continuous civil rights movement going on. So we're in June last year. And public monuments have also been making headlines, like, <laughs> you know, uh, another city has removed a problematic statue that for centuries has affirmed its supremacy, taking up space. Just like in a game of dominoes, one after another, they toppled down. It's quite odd what was happening at the time. Um, the debates around the public monuments glorifying figures historically known as oppressors of black bodies is one that often resurfaces. So I really want to emphasize on the fact that last year was not the first time that we heard about this at all. And the dilemma is always the same, to remove or not to remove. Public, I'm very Shakespearean as well. <laughs> public monuments are typically, typically placed in streets and squares um, by local authorities. As Italians, we see these in every piazza um, to commemorate and honor a figure tied to the local history. In its traditional form, the monument is a figure which publicly highlights the theme of memory and remembrance. Uh, that same memory from the Latin monumentum also includes a Latin known and warning. The monument can generally be characterized in three ways, most evidently in its verticality, raised on a plinth, a figure that interrupts the ordinary course of the space, thus creating a strange intertwining between above and below. Again, I'm setting the scene for us to remember about this in, op in oppression to black bodies. A second character is its allocation, whether it is surrounded by beautiful flower beds or condoned by chains, the monument is always defined in an area, serving as a sort of aura that frames um, the very often white figure, the fact and the date. Finally, what characterizes the monument is the material with which it is produced. Materials such as bronze or marble, deemed as eternal materials, which the sole purpose of them is obviously to outlive history, including obviously the aesthetic factors. In relation or oppression to black bodies, public monuments have always been political, of course. Um, anywhere in the world, when we think of the glorified traces of racist or misogynist and homophobic past represented by the many monuments dedicated to white men placed on plinths in times of tension, juxtaposed against black bodies fighting for freedom, demanding rights, or, you know, again, um, um, answering, oh, are you really Italian? It leaves a bit of a bitter taste. Um, somehow these monuments um, represent the roots of the living. They are therefore also a material force of political, religious, or cultural power. Um, therefore, what I'm trying to say is that removing a monument is more of a symbolic gesture, really. It does not erase the intellectual heritage of a figure, uh, which is handed down through their works, and definitely not via bronze or marble. Shock. <laughs> I can't help but wonder if the monument's purpose is to mark a milestone in the urban narrative, what happens then when history changes direction? So wait, again, still in the dark times of 2020. Surely placing a monument in a public space can't be a neutral action limited to the sole idea of homage or memory. Um, what I'm trying to argue is that a monument in a public space is a dominant voice, actually, a narrative that prevails over others, often that of authority and power. So how can an urban space that is not neutral and exalts oppressors exist in juxtaposition, juxtaposition, wow, English, to the destruction of black bodies? 
Revolutionaries have always demolished the symbols of power in case which they were re about. Therefore, as they currently stand and fall, monuments are not works of art per se. Um, art historians, please don't come and kill me, I'm one of you, but rather symbols. Um, unlike artworks, monuments um, should perhaps be judged ethically rather than just aesthetically. In the same spirit of revolution as an Afro-Italian woman, it is encouraging to witness real and active discourse around the decentering of white supremacy within an Italian context. I, for one, personally, um, in my 26 years of age, um, I grew up born and raised in Mantova. I didn't actually have Afro-Italian as a definition of, in terms of my identity. So I had to have that to just, you know, generalize myself with this and uh, it's been incredible and it's very encouraging and it's one that the same way we have with language is someone that constantly evolves and I'm sure that in 20 years there will be another way to self-define myself but, the, but the, the fact that that power relies within myself is one that I truly appreciate um, and as opposed to the full solidarity that is rightly extended to African Americans. So there is there was this discourse that we saw where it's just, you know, all of a sudden it's only George Floyd, it's only Ahmad Aubrey, it's only Breonna Taylor, but what about the ones that are in Italy? You know, um, so there is this thing that happens that adamantly ignoring the actual black people they share a country with. Um, Let's not forget that the existence of black bodies in what we know as Italy today precedes that of the formation of Italy in young 150 years ago. Who would have thought that inspired by the current civil rights movement is figure such as Indra Montanelli that um, I don't remember what panelists mentioned on Monday would actually resurface in public discourse and unanimously I'm gonna put an asterisk because of course we have people defending him still um, as a villain. Montanelli prior to becoming the glorified journalist of the nation was a fascist officer who in 36 during the Ethiopian campaign, um, he in his words um, took on Elise, a black 12 year old girl to marry and sexually abuse. Of course, this was frowned upon. Um, in 36 as well, because morality also exists uh, back then. Um, in fact, uh, as he explained in front of um, a crowd of a live audience um, during an interview in 69, he boasted that it was accepted practice in Ethiopia. Um, nonetheless, this passed. Fa fast forward to 2006 and the then mayor of Milan, Gabriele Albertini, decided to commission a monument dedicated to Montanelli in one of the most important parks in the city. The irony lies in the fact that while alive Montanelli was against commemorations, as he said that monuments are made to be demolished in, in his own words. Um, I am actually not sure how long I've been going on for, but I wanna say that um, like Chino Achebe and many other thinkers, I too recall that until the lion have their own historians, the history of their hunt will always glorify the hunter. And as the stand and fall, monuments are precisely the aesthetic imposition for which power self certifies and celebrates itself. So I am so excited for this conversation about what it means to reclaim anti racist spaces, both um, politically, socially, artistically. And again, thank you so much. And I hope I'm Italian, I speak very fast. So I hope I didn't actually zoom through that. That was great. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dora. And uh, any questions or comments about Ms. Dora's presentation, please post them in the Q&A. And in fact, we are now opening the Q&A section of our webinar. Um, and I will now hand over to Kumbola, who's uh, going to moderate it. Over to you, Kumbola. Thank you, Marina. Thank you to all the speakers. I really learn a lot. I don't want to say too much. I will leave time for the questions. I will start with the first question. And uh, the first question is by April Louis Pennant. Pennant. I'm wondering if you, April, want to ask the question directly. I know Magda is not here, but I think Julia can answer the question. And then we will also 
make sure that Magda, if she has something to add, can see the question. Can you read the questions through the chat, Julia? Or do you want me to read it? Okay, I can read it. Uh, it's for Magda, as I said. And uh, uh, hi, Magda, you say that you don't differ differentiate between different generations of Black Italians. However, isn't there different needs and experience? Do your services tailor to this? I think this is all supply for what you do as racism and a brutal story in general. Yeah. Um... Actually, I did read it. I have lost the chat. I think this question refers to what she mentioned about the CHAMPS project, the okay. fact that there was no differentiation between um, generations uh, and, and my, that there was not a specific on, on the migration background for the selection of the people engaged in the project. Um, and, uh, but, okay, so th this, I guess, is a bit strange to think what she would answer to okay, this so. question, but um, I can ask her after, um, also, I'm, I'm sorry I've taken some of her minutes without realizing that the five minutes were um, included, this is really bad, um, but I think she would say that, um, Yes, of course, the needs are very different uh, in, uh, in certain um, aspects, but that, um, and, and that the project does see, um, does want to have, um, to create tools um, that are specific because it's going to address uh, anti-Black racism in the, in health, in education, in welfare, um, in media, and um, in the world of volunteers. That's the, the section. But I think what she referred to was the idea that, um, that the differentiation uh, between different generations has had a, um, a negative impact in the capacity to address racism in Italy, um, in dividing the, the good second generation that eats pizza, da da da, and is real Italian and uh, the migrants. I think that's what that what that is what uh, she referred to. Okay, thank you very much, Julia. And then there is, uh, there is actually a couple of questions about uh, language or the question of languages in general. There is one by Loredana. Loredana, would you like to ask the question directly to read it? You are on mute and if you want, we cannot see you, Loredana. Uh, okay, I, I think you can hear me now, correct? Yeah, we yeah? Can. yeah. Okay. Um, even if you can't see me, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, with pleasure, but there are lots of questions about language. And I think for me, it was a question of, um, that came up with in Emmanuel's talk, but in so many other people's talk about how different languages and making those different languages audible and visible um, is part of that reclaiming, is or is not. You know, is it relevant to you in terms of reclaiming? Um, and, and occupying these anti-racist spaces and, and creating them. But lots of other people have also asked questions about how we translate between one language and another and, and how that shift becomes important. Um, I think the question of language is uh, very important. Like I said, for the Italian context, for example, you didn't have those type of uh, conversation before around race and racism in Italian. Uh, a lot of people um, that are doing all these works on uh, racism and race in Italy um, always had to look for uh, um, English content. And sometimes this uh, English content uh, does not fit, you know, with the... Um, with the Italian history because it's not the same, you know? Um, I don't know. Uh, for example, uh, I'm working in, um, 
in a in a fashion in a fashion company where we do all this work. I'm a linguist there, where we do all this work around um, you know language around um, you know um, race, religion, and everything like this. And uh, on a panel, um, they asked to a very famous black designer uh, that is French and black is <laughs> uh, the only one <laughs> actually in France. Uh, you know, it's called Olivier Roustin. And they asked him, you know, uh, what was um, his moments of black joy. And I reacted um, by saying that in France, French, uh, black French people don't have a concept of black joy because it doesn't exist for us. You know, it's a very um, uh, Anglo-Saxon, uh, Afro-American concept. So um, I, I think um, it's about knowing the history first be be before talking about the language, knowing the history, you know, the past. Um, the societal, um, you know, then impact of the past to the present, and then uh, think about it, you know. Um, and the reason why, for example, we uh, I chose a French person um, to talk to talk about, you know, um, these issues in Italian is because I uh, the, the podcast is um, uh, towards Italian people. We are talking about Italianity, right? We are not only talking about blackness. That's what people also confuse a lot. That when you talk about blackness in Italy, you are talking about Italianità. It's not just uh, you know um, uh, black people in Italy because black people in Italy are Italian too, right? So um, it, the, the the reason why we chose to uh, to talk about it in Italian is uh, because the, the 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 public we want to touch is uh, Italian first. Right. Then we are not doing English because we want to bring it to a European level. All right. Because English is the language that um, is, you know, a language of communication right now for most of the people. Um, but uh, first and foremost, Italian, because uh, this is a, an Italian question. I hope I answered I, I answer the question and I didn't took too much space if anyone wants to add something. Does anyone want to add something? about it and the question of language and uh, uh, for example there was also a question about uh, uh, where uh, there was, there was a, compar a comparison between uh, uh, the Benedicta podcast, uh, Emmanuel podcast and also Natasha Fernando podcast because Natasha podcast is about translation, uh, your podcast Benedicta is in Italian and uh, is in English sorry and uh, uh, Emmanuel podcast uh, is uh, in Italian. So would you like to add something else about language and languages? I can, I can share something. So like when it comes to the language, like referring to Loredana's question, uh, um, I want to say like, yes, I think it's important to think about languages in a different way and to represent the spaces because even within, um, I'm also part of the aspect of this movement, the story, we started to discuss whether we can use like native languages and uh, other languages to connect to audiences that create content. So for me, my choice of choosing English actually derives to the fact that, um, uh, especially goes back to the idea of connection. So as Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel said, like to connect with people outside of Italy, that's why she decided to use English in part of the podcast episode. So for me, my podcast idea also derives from the fact that oftentimes I have to look for content also for my students to refer to. And I realized that the content that was more like light-hearted uh, was not really available in English. So that's why I chose English. And also I feel due to the fact that I learned a lot more about racism and how to tackle racism and about racial identity while I was in London mm -hmm. compared to when I was in Italy. Because as Natasha said, as Emmanuel would say, Emmanuel was saying, like in, in Italian language, it's just now that we're using certain terms to talk about race and racism. So for this reason, I think sometimes even it comes more natural to me to even talk about whiteness in the English term. But if I have to give a conversation, a presentation in Italian, sometimes it can be difficult for me to say bianchezza, although now I'm becoming more comfortable using the term. So for this reason, and also I feel like I'm a little bit more confident, rather let it be like English, uh, then it comes Italian probably. And uh, and then other languages, I know my parents' language, for example, that they use at home, God, but I'm not that fluent, I feel, to share content so that's why I put it 
feel comfortable sharing in, in that language, although if I was, probably I would. Uh, thanks for that. I would just add, you know, without trying not to repeat myself, because I think, you know, um, I also kind of explored this during the presentation because Sularat is basically that, right? So translating uh, terms that we exploit in a way from from uh, the Anglo-American context without really trying, you know, reflecting them into the Italian one. And um, my, you know, it's interesting. And the thing is that we, you know, throughout the episodes as well, it's not that we're trying to give a definite solution to things like, yes, mm -hmm. you, you should you know, use these terms in this way, or we're trying to open the discussion up uh, for debates. And especially, you know, in terms of, and, and here I'm connecting uh, to one of the questions that were raised here. I don't remember exactly where, by Federica. Uh, I have a similar question. My students in Italy uh, asked me if it is offensive to write una persona di colore, what is the best way to say it in Italian, right? Um, and that's exactly what, you know, a few of our episodes, uh, when we talk about the one drop rule, when we talk about the N word, uh, we also try to explore how to call ourselves, right? And we do that by, okay, so to answer that question, for me personally, you know, I don't like that term of persona colorata di colore. Um, and we try to, especially in Adisha, and this was the interesting part in, in our own podcast, it was that, you know, we kind of butt heads on, on certain terms. Uh, but for Nadisha, you know, for example, she says, you know, it's a political act, as Angelica Pizzarini said in the first seminar as well, it's a political act to kind of identify yourself as Black, as a minority in Italy, right? But then again, I mean, you know, we, we all have so many different experiences, right, in our own communities. And for instance, for me, right, when I go back to Italy, yes, I identify as Nera. But then when I come to uh, London, I identify myself as brown. So, I mean, there are so many different shades and I think, you know, everyone here would agree that it's, it's quite complicated and complex. But what we say in the podcast is that these discussions should be led by visible minorities, right? By minorities, black people, people who are at the center of these debates, really. I don't know if I made sense, but yeah, trying to be also concise. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Benedict. And thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, I want to ask something to Ms. Tura because I'm in the, she's answering a question. So I don't want if she want to reply. I didn't, I didn't even know that you could see the fact that I was, <laughs> I was, I was like, <laughs> um, I just, um, apologies if I pronounce your name incorrectly, Orsolia. I was just answering her, that question. And um, there is an incredible and um, poignant digital project specifically looking at queerness and blackness in the Italian context um, called the, uh, My Queer Blackness, My Black Queerness. And I was just going to link that over um i think it's incredible and um, um jordan sort of um leads on that and i would just send the link sorry I, did i look like i was concentrating <laughs> i'm very passionate about it <laughs> we actually sorry to interrupt we actually interviewed jordan on the podcast too about it so, and so uh, you can also listen to the, that episode as well as a further <laughs> resource Um, yeah, um, on the question of blackness, I can also, uh, um, queerness, sorry, they are uh, Jordan, but Jordan is a Jamaican man living in Italy that does this project around, you know, a queer identity, but we also interviewed another uh, person who is not uh, known because uh, on the podcast we don't necessarily know, um, interview people that are, let's say, um, 
high profile and this person is a um, is a is a teacher in uh, in Italy so uh, I can also link to this episode it's, it is in Italian obviously but uh, uh, it's uh, interesting to have um, you know uh, his point of view too because uh, it it kind of um, links with uh, what Jordan said in, in, in his episode so I can link to that too if you want. Thank you both Emmanuel and Mistura. Mistura, I would like to ask you another question. I will want to ask you if you think there is an appropriate space for black artists in Italy and how black Italian artists can avoid the risk of seeing their work commodified, if you think there is this risk. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. There is always space for uh, Afro descendants, um, Italian, Afro-Italian artists. Um, I think they've always been there um, in terms of um, producing, creating knowledge. One thing that I find fascinating at the current present moment is the fact that it's uh, visible and active and then also exploring different forms of production as well. Um, there was a question, it sort of ties in with this question of language as well. Um, we're very obsessed with uh, just um, following a format, but actually I think when it comes uh, from artistic approaches, it would be interesting actually to take a, um, exp start experimenting truly, um, because when we think about the, at least with my kids and friend friendship groups, um, we actually speak a mix of different languages. One minute is pidgin, one minute is Italian, one minute is in English. And uh, if you're from the same town as, as me, one, another second is in dialetto in one sentence, right? And I think it's interesting to actually start operating and communicating and whether visually or orally in a way that is sort of reflects that, um, I guess, diasporian reality. And there were questions as well about how should I um, refer to um, persone di colore in, it in Italy? Uh, ask anyone. Um, everybody has uh, this beautiful agency of self-definition and actually listen with uh, your own presumptions of how one person would like to be defined. Again, I. I, I refer to myself as Afro-Italian, but I would tell you one of my best friends absolutely despises that. And they rather um, sort of be defined as Italian Nigerian or Nigerian Italian, because obviously you have that um, duality between a whole continent and a tiny country. You know, um, one thing that we really need to remember when, to be honest, approaching and relating with anyone in the diaspora is that we're not a monolith and there is so many different layers and how exciting it is to actually explore the layers rather than just um, lazily just, I guess, try and generalize. Generalization, as far as I'm concerned, historically has not um, led anyone anywhere good. Um, actually, the, the multiplicity and plurality of uh, the the reality of our society is what's exciting. So there isn't um, a direct answer to how self-definition works. It's self-definition for a reason. And in terms of spaces, um, what needs to happen in, in the Italian context and many other countries as well is also an issue of funding. So how do we create anti-racist spaces or spaces for artists to actually uh, nurture and uh, develop their practice it's, it's a matter of funding as well, because uh, um, last time I checked, exposure doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> Thank you, Misura. I want to ask something to Julia, because I know that there's racism and a bruta storia, you have worked extensively with teachers, and I would like to know, given the importance of education, what is their response, and if they are aware of the importance to address uh, systemic uh, institutional racism? Um, okay, before um, the, uh, answering to the role of education, I just wanted to say that I put here in the chat um, a project uh, on, on language that um, Racismo Bruta Storia is supporting by um, 
poet uh, from from Italian Moroccan background with Sal Hubabi with um, um, with the dancer uh, from from Nigerian Italian background uh, Ophelia Valogun. Um, it's called Scrivere con i piedi, and it's a performance in Darja language. Um, Wissal uses dialect to, uh, well, the Moroccan dialect to create a sound that also makes you think of Italian words. And it's all about uh, dislocating the Eurocentric perspective through language. Um, and this is a project that now also, I guess, I, I'm, I'm really thankful and humbled by all your amazing presentations and insights. Um, I, I, I hope this will be a space for, for, for new collaborations. I just wanted to say that the um, Wissal and Ophelia has um, engaged us in asking for, for funding to the British Council. Um, and we created a partnership with uh, a festival in Morocco and uh, the IRI school that you may know, the Londoners, with, with the, the first uh, university that it explores Afro-Caribbean dancing and gives the diplomas. And yeah, so the, the, this whole thing about language is really, um, an exciting new new space and then we saw is also researching the shifting of uh, colonial languages in Morocco like from French moving now to English um, education is good <laughs> it's good education is good for fighting racism um, and um, so I, I don't know if this is um, if if this was understood from 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 my presentation. But what Razzismo Brutta Storia is trying to do is is moving from uh, its previous way of doing anti-racist work in schools that was quite um, like a classic intercultural education uh, to. As, as was mentioned in the question to uh, how, how to address uh, systemic racism and also how to uh, work, like how to really develop a, a pedagogy that accounts for empowerment, like orientation to empowerment in mixed, classrooms as different to anti-racist education for, for, for if, it's a, if, if it's a group with native kids and, um, uh, and, and um, <laughs> words, 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 uh, yeah, and, and racialized kids. Um, so at, at the moment, uh, one, uh, line of, of research would, would want to be to create a sort of permanent um, laboratory sp research space uh, together with the Feltrinelli Foundation and universities to really try to see what's been done, what, what, what is needed, and try to develop some methodologies can, that can be used because we have, at the moment we do have like maybe every day, three or four teachers uh, writing to us, asking us for uh, resources. And uh, also it would be very great to link up to you guys and see, um, yeah, and, and develop joint um, actions on, on the education uh, field. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much. I have a question for our podcast creator, and I will ask them to answer quite briefly. Uh, uh, is uh, 
The, the question is by Fabiola Tosi. Many of you are using podcast as a preferred medium to communicate and build awareness on anti-racism. Why do you think this type of media is particularly effective and how do you see it differing from other media such as printed or online journals and essays, social media in terms of effectiveness and engagement? I don't know who one want to go first. I can go first if you want. Um, I think so. Um, when we started, um, before starting uh, Black Coffee, we're actually talking about doing a YouTube series, right? More of uh, interviews on YouTube. Uh, but obviously me being based in London and RM being based in, uh, in, um, in Milan, uh, that was quite, uh, that has proven difficult, even though, you know, I was like, okay, I can come every three months and we can try to, uh, you know, do that, um, record episodes when we have the guests and everything. You know, and I was thinking of going every three months, like for one week and do that. And obviously the pandemic ha happened and uh, we have to reconsider. And um, I actually proposed her the idea um, of the of the podcast because uh, I already had, you know, one by myself. And um, why I chose a podcast? I'm a writer first as a, you know, in my daily job, I'm a writer. And um, I use that medium because, uh, first of all, I think it's... Um, it felt like I was um, uh, spending less time in the format I chose to do my podcast, you know, than writing, you know, doing the podcast because you just sit there and you speak. And then obviously you have to edit. Uh, it depends what kind of uh, podcast you want to do. Obviously, if you want to uh, have a um, super effects on the podcast, yeah, it will require a lot of time and work. Uh, but if you do um, a podcast, it's very simple. You you can use your phone, you can buy a microphone, you, you know, uh, it's very simple to do, right? And also, I, um, I think at the moment, um, there is an explosion of uh, uh, the, po the podcast industry in general in the, in the global context. But um, I do think it's even more uh, so in, um, no, in Europe, um, because it enables uh, people that uh, had not a voice before to have a voice. In the American context, I think it's a lot of entrepreneurial, you know, people that doing that for business. And you also obviously have people that talk about racing there. But uh, on the European level, I do think that because the media does not let us um, uh, talk about ourselves or does not represent ourselves at all, on, or when they talk about us, it's in a very derogative way. Uh, or um, when even th when they try to do it uh, with the best intentions at are um, you know at heart, you still feel like okay, well <laughs> that's not it, um, you know. So um, I do think it's uh, you know I, why I talk about um, you know uh, um, talking about our own stories, you know, uh, in my presentation was actually uh, because of that, you know, having uh, an outlet to talk about ourselves by ourselves, not that talking about uh, ourselves by others. That was the, the main point. And I think a podcast is um, the right medium to do to do that. And also because I do think in the Italian context, context and also in the French context, uh, the media are uh, held by a certain type of people, uh, you know, and these type, of, uh, these type of people, they choose a certain type of narrative to, uh, to bring on. Um, and so even when you come to them and present them a story, that's why we also like the independence of uh, the podcast rather than being a production, you know, well oiled and everything. Because I do think that once you uh, have a producer or something, sometimes they don't let you express yourself as, as much as you want, you know. Hey, Manuela, I'm wondering if Benedicta wants to add something. Yeah, sure. So I, I honestly, I started my podcast because I'm not, I consider myself not being very good at writing. So, but better on talking. So that's very practical reason. Also, reflecting right now on why you, why preferring a podcast. A podcast is more accessible on different levels, which means economically, it's easier to make because a microphone and a headphones you can still purchase it, purchase them at a very like lower price. The, the, of course, you can spend more on the equipment, but actually like you can produce good quality sound and 
with good effort, the good skills. So that's one thing, accessibility for sure. Uh, I think also because the time as well, as Emmanuel mentioned, uh, the time, I th although still editing a podcast can still take some time. And I realized there are times where I, it takes me like, a good old day for an episode of an hour because you have to edit a lot uh, with, with a focus. But definitely, I think the sustainability and also when it comes to time, the fact that you can listen to podcasts even while working, oftentimes I put a podcast in the background while doing my work. So it's accessibility on so many different levels and also it makes connection more accessible with other people. So with me, many of my guests, sometimes they're not based in Italy, sometimes they're based around the world. So that makes it very easier for me to connect with my guests. Thank you, Benedicta. Natasha, would you like to add something very briefly? I mean, basically what, you know, <laughs> Emmanuel and Benedicto just said that it's really cost effective, that it's simpler way of editing because you only have uh, the audio in a way to, to edit. Um, but also I kind of want to point out that it's, it's a new form of blogging, if one must say. And, and you know, if you consider how blogs um, became famous, became popular, you know, in the old kind of ARPANET uh, periods when the internet was just evolving was that it was a de democratizing kind of uh, instrument, right? Blogging, it gave access to different people. It gave also the possibility to people who didn't have, you know, uh, um, I would say a degree, who didn't have a, uh, who weren't journalists, you know, uh, to express their own voice in a way. So in, in that way, I feel that uh, podcasts are right now, you know, the new form of kind of storytelling, new forms of um, new form, create new form of journalism as well. And to be honest, we, you know, us three, me, Maria and, and Adisha all love podcasts. So we kind of straight went straight to that because of that as well. Just that. Thank you, Natasha. I have just two questions left, I think. One is for uh, Ms. Tura, and I would like uh, her to say something more about her project, Ashiko, because she mentioned it, so I'm very curious what it's about. Thank you. Well, <laughs> well uh, Ashiko is an art platform for practitioners, um, art practitioners and curators and artists and none, specifically none. Um, to just exchange um, different ideas and developed. Um, it's very much, um, we like to call it a living archive. So it's one where we're constantly creating, producing, experimenting, exchanging. And yes, it's inspired by African, by Africa, but it doesn't claim to be African. Um, it's a, a, my ode to the diaspora really. And this, um, I guess, um, effort into building a, a language and a visual culture that we can refer to um, in, in the future. Um, we are actively building new references and points of references and a shorthand. Um, it started as an inside joke. Um, it's a, this yearning um, and wanting of belonging, you know, when, when for me as an Afro-Italian, when I was in Italy, I was uh, too other to be merely Italian. And then I, <laughs> I embarked on this journey of self-vindication. So after my master's, I spent three months in Nigeria. And before I even spoke a word which I'd like to note, I speak fluent Yoruba. They knew I wasn't from there. So it was like, at what point can I actually win, right? So as a joke, I've always said that perhaps we should have an uncolonized land and where the whole diaspora can be. And we have a shorthand of, you know, in terms of language and our visual culture and just um, popular culture. And of course, that's not quite possible logistically. So that's how Ashiko started. And we're actually launching online um, officially this week. And with a inaugural print cell um, with an amazing artist and also we have an audio visual um, it's not necessarily a podcast I like to is um in it's sort of framed in this concept of call and response um, where we have a 
civic discussions and is a streaming platform as well for films. Thank you, Ms. Dura. The last Thank question you. is for Emanuela uh, by Kayarist. She asked uh, what was one of uh, the key experiences you had in England that made you embrace your blackness more? And now might others in diaspora do the same? Um, so uh, when I arrive in England, it's a, bit, it's a big experience that um, I arrive in a place that is uh, very black. That was Brixton. Brixton was, uh, was uh, a place um, where you had the first uh, generation of Jamaican coming there. And uh, when I arrived be before, it has become gentr gentrified like right now, <laughs> because they love to gentrify everything, right? Um, I arrived there and uh, I came there. I remember it was during uh, this festival called the Brixton Splash. And I saw so many black people in this place. And you have to think about uh, my context as a French person. So as a French person, I don't come from Paris because they like to uh, define uh, black French people as coming from Paris and living in the banlieue. I don't come from the banlieue. Uh, I've grew up in a very uh, white uh, space. Uh, so I was always the only um, the only person there, and uh, so I don't I didn't know what it means to be surrounded only by majority of black people, right? Uh, same when I came to Italy, same when I went to Germany, and arriving to Brixton, I was with my luggage, you know, you know, getting to my new house, and I saw around me so many uh, black people, and I was like, all right, and this is not Brixton is not uh, like banlieue. You know, it's just a, a neighborhood, right? Because uh, uh, banlieue in France has a very um, specific uh, definition. It's uh, always like the hood, basically, Def defined like this. Um, and here uh, in Brixton, I saw that um, there is kind of, um, um, I can say the diversity there. Yeah, you have some parts of Brixton that looks like a little bit rundown and you have some places that look like more, uh, um, let's say, uh, I don't know how to say kept up, I don't know. But anyway, uh, when I arrived there, I was like, okay, that's interesting that I am living in a, in a place where you see a lot of black people. And also at work, um, started working at Topshop in the headquarters and you see black people at some level, you know, of, uh, of management which uh, uh, was something I didn't experience in any other places. So this is something that makes you reflect on, um, on your blackness, even though obviously you, owe it, you still have this sailing glass here, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, and nowhere is perfect, but here it was quite interesting. And also the fact that uh, people can speak about blackness. I come from a country that if you have, uh, if we try to have this type of event, it, it is forbidden by law. I, we cannot do that in France. It's it's forbidden. So um, um, you cannot have uh, spaces where you have uh, black women talking about uh, femini um, black feminism. You cannot. They will. Uh, they won't let you do that. Um, so um, I think it's quite important to uh, think about the context where I come from. Uh, to understand why, um, you know, here in London, I felt like more embracing my uh, uh, my identity. Also, coming from uh, um, the French colon uh, French colonialism makes you um, really kind of erase your other identity, um, as opposed to, for example, um, the British colonialism. I no colonialism is good, but you know, at least you have this little sense of identity still because uh, British people understood that they had to let people have a little bit of, a, of their identity for their for things to function. Whereas in my case in France, it's really, um, it's not like that. Like people like to point out your uh, Africanity and everything, but uh, you actually don't know about your Africanity because you don't learn about anything about it because everyone is telling you that you're French first and foremost, you know? Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Thank you. And uh, it has just arrived another question, and I'm sure that we will probably uh, try to I mean, uh, make you, not, I was saying your details are available, but I would like to, I mean, uh, we will send over to the participant some contacts, uh, some uh, links uh, so that they can contact directly all the speakers. What do you think, Marina, so we can 
to this. We will send uh, uh, your Instagram page or something like that so that I can, uh, if someone is interested in getting in contact with you, can do that. Unfortunately, it looks like uh, the time is up and uh, I really want to thank everyone uh, who attended this event today and uh, also on uh, Monday. I really want to thank all the speakers. It was uh, amazing and I really learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marina, for your help. And of course, a special thanks to the Lebelium Trust and Cardiff University School of Modern Languages, which have given me the possibility of organizing this event. I really, really hope this, that there will be many more similar occasions, as Julia said and some other of you said uh, to meet and uh, discuss uh, and uh, share mainly. There will be a survey coming up when you leave the webinar and uh, it will appear on the screen. Uh, and uh, yes, it was really a pleasure and uh, I feel, uh, I really feel rich. Thank you, grazie mille. <laughs> Grazie, grazie per averci. Thank you, Comola. Grazie, grazie mille. Grazie. Un bacio. Grazie a tutti. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao. 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 ciao.